Father, we thank you that you love us, that you sent your son to this earth to live the perfect life and die for us. Father, we recognize that we are sinners, that we have fallen short of your glory, Father. But we thank you that you have redeemed us from the wages of sin, which is death. We thank you for this family. We thank you for your word that encourages us and shows us the way. And I pray that you would encourage us today not only to know the promises that you have given to us, but to act on those promises and to share those promises with those around us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This year, as we've been talking all year so far, this year the theme is to go and tell, to tell others. And uh, last month we spent talking about things in our life that either enhance our message or take away from our message. Um, but this month we're going to begin to look at the good news of Jesus. And you know, the reason we're going to do this is because you've got you to know this stuff in order to be able to tell people this stuff. Okay, so here's what I want you to do. If you have a bulletin or if you have a piece of paper and you're not comfortable with sharing the gospel with your, your neighbor, you're, you're just not the person that goes, hey, let's have a Bible study. Okay, I want you to write these verses down that we talk about today because these are things that you need to know. These are passages that will help you to be able to explain to other people why it's important to come and be a part of Jesus' family, to be a brother or sister to him, to be a son or daughter of God most high. Why it's important to find salvation in Jesus. And so as we begin, we're going to talk about the good news. And today's sermon is, uh, is titled Perfection. Because that's something that we all wish that we could find. But we all come up short of that all the time, don't we? Anybody in here perfect in and of yourself? Nobody raise their hand? Good. At least there's no liars in here today. At least not for that question. So, um, so we're, going to start off, we're going to start off by looking at the good news today. And this month we're going to talk about... Jesus' life. We're going to talk about the cross, why it's significant. We're going to talk about the resurrection, what that matters. And we're going to talk about the kingdom of God, why that is the central message of the entire Bible, actually. And so today we're going to look at the life of Jesus. But before we get into the good news, we've got to look at the bad news. Um, interestingly, the, the good news in our Bibles, the good news, the word for that is actually gospel. And uh, so when you read the word gospel, it literally means good news. But when I ask people, what is the gospel, I get all kinds of answers. I get answers like, it's the Bible. It's the, the four books that talk about Jesus, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Okay? But when you look at the word, good new, the word gospel, it literally means good news. But the Bible isn't full of good news. There's a lot of good news in there, but there's some bad news in the Bible too. So we can know by looking at that that the, that the good news isn't just the Bible in and of itself. Okay, There is something great that is within the Bible. But the Bible talks about some bad news, and we got to know the bad news in order to be able to appreciate the good news. Okay, The bad news is, goes like this. The scripture declares that the whole world is a prisoner of sin. How many of you in here have sinned? If you didn't raise your hand just now, I'm going to tell you. Thank you, Ted. Ted's like back there like this. <laughs> what is it? The, I know my sin. My sin is always before me, David would say. Paul would say, I'm the worst of sinners, the chief of sinners. And some of us feel like that. We feel, we feel our sin. We know our sin. We know the ways that we've gone against God's will or the ways that we've gone against other people, the way we've wronged others. And the scripture says the whole world is in prison to sin. The scriptures also say, um, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. For all have sinned. That includes me. And that includes you. So when I say, who has sinned? The correct response is me. So I'm asking you that question. Who has sinned? Me. me. That's important for us to understand. Because the wages of sin is yeah. death. Well, that's not good news at all. The scripture also says this in Isaiah 59. Your iniquities have made a separation between you and God. And your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. Your sin has separated you from God. Without something being done about your sin, 
you don't have a relationship with God. There is no hope of eternal life. There is no eternal life here on this earth. You're not connected to the family of God without your sins being taken care of because you're still a prisoner to the world, a prisoner to Satan. It's vital that something gets done about our sin problem. And everyone has a sin problem, and that's bad news. But there is good news. So we want to talk about good news for the rest of this month, right? Bad news, we all recognize that. We all recognize our sin. Everyone has a sin problem. The good news, though, is that something has been done to take care of our sin problem. And the even greater news is you're not the one that has to do it. That's really good news. Because the wages of sin is death. And I can't afford that. That's too expensive for me. I could afford it, but I don't really want to, really. Right? So, looking at the good news, <clears throat> we back up to John chapter 1. In John chapter 1, it's, it begins by saying, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things have, were made through Him, and without Him not anything was made that was made. It was, was not anything made that was made. Who is the Word? Jesus is the Word. Okay? Um, and in this scripture, what we see is that Jesus was in the beginning, before the beginning even. He was with God, and he was God. So is Jesus God? Yes. yes, Jesus is God. And without Jesus, nothing has been made. So who created everything? Did God create everything, or did Jesus create everything? Yes. The correct answer is yes. Okay? Jesus is God. And that's, that's really important for us to understand because when you think of Jesus and you think of God, I want you to picture him in the throne room of heaven, ruling over everything, the creator of the universe, above all things, all-powerful, all-knowing, all-present, God. Amen. That's Jesus. But in verse 14, he says, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. He didn't come down and like hover and watch. He came down and intermingled with us. And we have seen his glory. Glory as of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. The central message to the whole Bible is the Messiah is coming. And when the Messiah came, it was significant that the Messiah wasn't just another human being. This is God giving up his eternal throne in heaven, that whole thing there, and coming and, and being a human being. And, and John would say this specifically this way, because some people believe that Jesus was God, but he was just a spirit without a body. And John says, no, no, he was flesh. He was born flesh. And some people said he was man, but he wasn't God. But John clears that up too. He was with God in the beginning and he created everything. So is Jesus God or is Jesus man? Yes. yes. A lot of yes answers today. In fact, the scripture says that in Christ all things are yes. Okay? So, in Jesus we see fully God and fully man. He would go on and say in verse 16, For from his fullness we have all received grace and upon grace. How many of you are excited about the grace we've received from God? That's exciting. We deserved death, but we get life. That's grace. For the law was given through Moses. The law that brought death was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God the only God who is at the Father's side, he has made him known. That last phrase there, the only God who is at the Father's side, that whole phrase right there is Jesus. Jesus is the only God who is at the Father's side. Jesus has made God known. When you look at Jesus, you can better understand God. So one of the reasons that Jesus came here was so that we could better grasp what God is like and how God feels about us. Okay? When you see Jesus, you see God. That's really important for us. 
Because we, we see this picture of God, and he's this ethereal kind of idea, this, this theoretical concept. But we have no tangible grasp of God because he's out there. But he's in Jesus. And so when we look back at the historical person of Jesus, we see what God is like. He is the exact representation of God. In Hebrews chapter 7, it talks about the life of of Jesus. And he says this, for it was indeed fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. One of the things that Jesus did when he came to this earth is he had this relationship with God that was inseparable. He said, I can't do anything without the Father. And his whole life was lived in worship and in mediation with God. And now that he is up in the throne room of God now, he's making intercession for us. He's the mediator for us. But he's perfect, holy, without blemish, innocent. And he lived his whole life. And while everyone in here raised their hands when I asked who has sinned in here, if Jesus was in here, he would not raise his hand. Because he's the only human being who has ever lived that never did anything against the will of God or against other human beings. Now some of you go, well, what about throwing the temple money changers and all this stuff? He was trying to help human beings by doing that. They're cheating people. They're, they're uh, destroying the nature of what the temple was about, perverting religion. And he got rid of them so that the people could be connected with God again. Jesus was the perfect priest offering the perfect worship for us. And so not only does he help us to understand God, but through Jesus, we can actually achieve perfect worship. Okay? We want to think about that a lot. Our flawed worship, our ways in which, I mean, come on, guys. You understand what I'm talking about. You're here on Sunday morning, we're taking communion together, trying to worship God, we're singing, and we can't help but smell lunch. And so our mind's distracted. Or maybe yesterday, you did something really wrong, and today all you can think about is that thing. Or maybe something corrupted your mind, and as you're trying to worship God, Satan has caused your mind to wander to all these other things that aren't necessarily righteous at all. Our worship is imperfect, but through Christ, it's like he's the filter. And so all God receives from us is perfect worship. And that's exciting too. In Hebrews chapter 4, though, the Hebrew writer would describe why it was so important for Jesus to come here and be a man just like us. In Hebrews chapter 4, he says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. I want you to think about the things that tempt you. For just a minute. Think about those things. Now imagine Jesus being tempted with those very same things. The thing about Jesus coming to this earth and living the perfect life is this. He became a man so that God could have empathy for us. It's not just sympathy. He's not just looking down on us, having pity on us. Jesus looks over at us and says, I understand. Think about Greek mythology. Okay? I like to watch those old Greek mythology kind of movies, you know, um, the Odyssey, things like that, Clash of the Titans. All those cool kind of movies with the claymation kind of figurines. You know what I'm talking about. The giant scorpions and, the, you know, Medusa and all that stuff. I like to watch those movies because they're entertaining. But it always breaks my heart that the gods portrayed in those movies are so far removed from humanity that they look down on humanity with disdain as if they are some kind of objects to own and to manipulate. Through Jesus, God doesn't look at us like that. God became a man and understands us. And when you fall to temptation, God understands why that happened. And so he can have mercy 
and grace for us. He understands our temptations and offers grace upon grace. So we have Jesus who became a man and he lived this perfect life so that we could understand God, so that we could have perfect worship through him, and so that God could understand us. But probably the thing that impacts me the most is I recognize that my life is imperfect. Every single day my life is imperfect. And the only way to come into the presence of God is to be perfectly righteous. And I can't do it. Some of you understand the frustration, right? You really wish you were a whole lot better than you are. And it's frustrating because you want to be different. But you keep messing up over and over and over again. You do the same things over and over again. And you beat yourself up about it. Because if I was only better, things would be different. If only I could do this or that, my life would be better. And we mess up and we're worried about our relationship with God because we messed up. But through Jesus, we don't have to worry about our relationship with God anymore. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, the Apostle Paul says this, For our sake, he made him, that's Jesus, to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus would say when he was on the earth in Matthew 6, 33, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. Seek the righteousness of God first. And according to, first, to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, the only way that we can receive righteousness is through this interchange exchange. Jesus lived the perfect life and when we get connected to Jesus, he takes our imperfect life on him and he gives us his perfect life, allowing us to come before the Father. That's good news, folks. Your imperfect life does not have to keep you from the presence of God. Jesus lived the perfect life so we don't have to. That's a crazy thought. All these other religions out there teach us that we have to do certain things in order to achieve a certain presence of God, a certain level of his uh, goodness or, or his, his gifting, okay, to achieve a certain level of salvation. In Christianity, we don't have to do anything. <clears throat> Jesus did it all. We get to receive the benefit of what he's done. He lived the perfect life so that we don't have to. You see, church, through Jesus' perfection, we have access to the Father by his grace, not by our merit, because we've already broken the merit system. We have to rely on the grace of God. You remember back in Hebrews 4 where we read that Jesus was the high priest that is able to, to sympathize with our weaknesses? You guys remember that? The very next verse, he says this. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Because Jesus was the perfect priest and the perfect sacrifice, living the perfect life. When we have the exchange of lives, his perfect life for our sinless one. When we receive his perfect life, we have confidence to enter the throne of grace, the holy place where God sits on the throne. Guys, without Jesus' perfect life, you couldn't even pray directly to God. It takes Jesus for us to do that. It takes Jesus for us to have salvation. It takes Jesus for us not to have to go and make sacrifice after sacrifice after sacrifice like they did in the Old Testament. He lived the perfect life so that we don't have to. So if you come to Christ, if you come to Christ, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, it says this, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Church, if you come to Christ, if you 
allow him to take your sins away, he gives you a new creation, a new life. When God looks at you, he doesn't see rank heathen sinner. He sees my perfect child. And that's good news. And without that, we don't get any of that. Without Jesus' perfect life, we don't get any of that benefit with God. None of it. There's one more thing I want to remind us before we're done. Remember when I said Jesus lived the perfect life so that we don't have to? Okay? That sounds really permissive. If Jesus lived this perfect life, I may as well sin all I want because everything's good. Jesus got it covered, right? We got to take all the scripture in when we understand that stuff. And in Romans chapter 6, he says this What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How, we, how can we who died to sin still live in it? So Jesus lived the perfect life so that we can understand God better. We can just get a grasp of, of how he thinks about us and how he cares about us. So that we can worship him perfectly. So that he can understand us and have empathy for us. And so that our lives of sin don't have to count against us because his life of perfection counts in our stead. That's good news, church. And that's why it's important for Jesus to come and become flesh and live among us. So this morning, the encouragement for you is to, if you are in Christ, to learn these things, to, to pray and thank God for these things and to share these things with others. But if, you're, if your sins haven't been washed away this morning, if you haven't been connected to Christ, if you've not been baptized into Christ, then today's the day where you're the one that needs to have that exchange of lives. Give him your sinful dead self and be made alive in Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the gift that you have given us of Jesus. The cross would have been enough. The empty tomb would have been enough. But that Jesus lived perfectly in our place is such a great gift, Father. Thank you that you understand us, that you seek to understand us, that you have empathy for us. Thank you, Father. That you don't hold our sins against us, but you allow us to come into the righteousness of Jesus. Thank you, Father, that we don't have to earn your favor by what we've done. And Father, help us to sin less and less every day in honor of the new life that we, have, that we live through your Son. This morning, I pray if there's anyone in here today that needs to begin their life with you, that the decision would be made today to do that. Put on Christ in baptism to surrender the life of sin and death and to receive the life of grace, and righteousness, and eternal life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So we have a time.